So now in this next video, which we'll just entitle Gymnosperms 2, we're going to just finish off and complete our look at the life cycle of gymnosperms. And we started our look at this life cycle, so let me just subtitle this life cycle continued. We started this look at the life cycle by establishing the fact that we have distinct male and female parts of these cone-bearing plants. And so now we're going to see how those distinct male and female parts of these cone-bearing plants are going to really interact with each other to produce eventually an absolutely new plant altogether that's genetically variable. So the first event that's going to occur for this to sort of get started is the fact that we need pollination to occur. So pollination is the starting point of this. And pollination, remember, is just when you have sperm transferring to the part of the plant that contains the ovules. But this trip to get to that is not as simple as we initially defined it. We're going to have a couple of different steps to get there. So first and foremost, in order for pollination to happen, our first step is the fact that we'll just say the pollen grain Remember, the pollen grain has two cells within it, and that's as a result of that microsporangia to microsporocyte to microspore to eventually male gametophyte pollen grain transition, hopefully didn't lose you there, that we did to get to the pollen grain. That pollen grain is going to, I will tell you, reach ovule. Okay, so it's gotten to the to the ovules. That's essentially what pollination was, right? But there's going to be a little bit more to this story. So the pollen grain reaches ovule. From there, the next logical step, and this is true of all pollination events, is that the pollen grain is going to uh, germinate. So the pollen grain germinates. Germinates just means it, it, it's going to start growing. It's going to start developing further. Okay. Now remember, the pollen grain is only two cells, so it can't do much in terms of its development until it actually has some sort of uh, egg to fertilize as well. And we're going to get to that in just a second. So once the pollen grain starts, let's say, growing and doing its thing and developing a little bit, this germination is going to allow for the following. The tube cell, remember, that's the one that's going to make the pollen tube. The tube cell within the pollen grain, that's one of the two cells, so within the pollen grain, it's going to begin producing the pollen tube, just like we imagined and just like we stated. So nothing new here. So what is the purpose of this pollen tube? Why are we producing this structure? Why do we have this as a part of the pollen grain overall two cell structure? Well, that's because the pollen tube has a very specific job, a very important job. And that is the fact that in gymnosperms, the pollen tube digests, it literally breaks its way through to the megasporangium structure of the ovule through to megasporangium. Why is it going to the megasporangium? Well, first of all, male or female, the megasporangium. This is the female part of the plant. So we have the male sort of, uh, let's say, fertilization technique is to get this tube cell to grow, digest its way, and create sort of this tube, literally create a tube for that generative cell, which we'll get to, to eventually reach the place that will have the egg and the ultimate sort of after the ultimate development of the megasporangium into the egg structure, which we'll do right now. So this is basically, I like to do this as the male side of the story. This is what's happening on the male side. While this is happening, on the female side, we're going to have some very important stuff also going on simultaneously. So it's a very, very complex process. So we'll say that while the pollen tube because it doesn't just happen instantaneously, but while the pollen tube is growing, let's say it's digesting its way towards that megasporangium, so we'll say dot, dot, dot to build some suspense. So while this is growing on the side, we're going to be having activity within the megasporangium. So there will be, I'll say, activity within the female side of the story, the megasporangium. So that's why I sort of divided this flowchart into the male and female side. Here, what's going to be happening is the following. The megasporocyte, which is the larger sort of cellular structure within the megasporangium. The megasporangium is the largest. Then within that is a megasporocyte, which is a little bit smaller. This is going to specifically produce four haploid 
So we're going from 2n, sporocyte, which is always 2n, produces 4 haploid, which is n. 4 haploid cells, how did we do that? Not through magic, but through meiosis. Via meiosis. Okay, so now we've noticed that anytime you see sporocyte, in order for the spore or haploid version of that sporocyte to develop, you need to do meiosis, and that's exactly what happens here. Okay, so after meiosis is done, of these four haploid cells, what has what's going on? Why do we have four? Well, what's going to happen is one of these four cells, one cell, actually will survive, and specifically survives to become the megaspore. So we basically have these four develop as sort of a, a, uh, an, a sort of safety net so that we have at least one cell survive to become that ever famous megaspore. Because again, we're in the megasporangium, we're going to have a megasporocyte produce a megaspore, but only one of those four that are created by meiosis becomes the ever so important megaspore. Now, whenever we see megaspore, we know the next logical step is to go from this megaspore state to the ultimate female gametophyte stage that we need to get to in order for fertilization to happen. So megaspore, will say, further develops into the female gametophyte. And that's what we needed to get to. Where did we start at? We started at a large sort of sporophytic structure within this megasporangium. And we now have gone all the way to the female gametophyte structure. Now, the female gametophyte within it, to make things even more complex and complicated, the female gametophyte, I'll say, so just to make things even more interesting, we'll go a step further and say that the female gametophyte uh, will be with two or three archegonia. And now we know that whenever you see archegonia, um, not anther, but arca, which is the female version of that. This is this specifically a female part of the female gametophyte. These archegonia will each produce an egg. And that's what we needed to get to. Each archegonia, each, uh, let me rewrite that, archegonia produces egg. And that's what we needed to get to. We needed to get to the egg because we have a sperm cell that's trying to go through this pollen tube into the megasporangium and eventually fertilize this egg. Notice how nothing about fertilization has been mentioned yet. Pollination is definitely not fertilization. This step, this developmental step from the female side of the story is not fertilization. What is fertilization? Well, that's going to happen in our final point of our flow chart right over here. So, finally, all this buildup, all this suspense is going to lead to the following. Once the pollen tube, that very important second cell structure of this po entire pollen grain, that pollen tube, once the pollen tube reaches the archegonia, so that's where something important is, right? The archegonia is where the egg is. And so once it reaches the archegonia, the sperm cell, that generative cell that we talked about, the other part of the pollen grain, the sperm cell is fully developed. So now we have an opportunity for something very important to happen. You have a fully developed sperm cell. You have an archegonia that has an egg waiting to be fertilized. What do you expect to happen next? Of course, that important life harboring process of fertilization occurs and the fertilization will be specifically with, from with the sperm will fertilize with the egg to give us and produce a diploid zygote just like you would expect a diploid zygote you're combining a haploid structure with another haploid structure because you did meiosis to get that you did meiosis to get the tube cell thus you're going to do meiosis to get the sperm cell the fertilization with egg to produce a diploid zygote is our final sort of step. But because we're talking about land plants, this gets sort of a little bit more to it because of the fact that once fertilization happens, fertilization itself, fertilization is going to initiate something very, very important that's specific to gymnosperm, specific to land plants that have seeds. Fertilization initiates the surrounding, because remember where we are right now, we're in the female part of the plant, the archegonia, 
The Arctagonia is surrounded by the gametophyte, and the gametophyte is surrounded by the megaspore, and the megaspore is surrounded by the megasporocyte, and this is surrounded by the megasporangium. All of this is happening there. So fertilization initiates the surrounding total structure, the larger female structure known as the ovule. That ovule structure, which houses all of this fancy development, fertilization initiates the surrounding ovule structure to transition and become a seed. Why a seed? We're talking about gymnosperms. These are plants that produce seeds, and the seed production only happens if fertilization happens. And this is going to happen, and once this happens, within the seed you will have a developing embryo, of course, diploid because of the fertilization. That's basically our diploid zygote, the embryo of the seed. The seed will also contain with it a good amount of food supply, just in case there needs to be dormancy. It will also have a rough and tough seed coat to make sure that the seed doesn't dry out, let's say, if there's no water, to make sure that the seed can withstand harsh conditions. Overall, take a look at figure 30.3 and 30.4 to really drive home this complicated yet pretty intricate and awesome process of gymnosperm life cycle. Very important to look at the male side, the female side, the combination of both, and look how development is occurring within both to eventually lead to a growing and healthy seed structure.